lovely Calimaris. This is Calimara here. I'm doing clinical pracs at the moment, but this is genuinely a really important video and I feel like I have to talk about it just so I can give closure to myself and move on. It's pretty much a story time on something that upset me quite a bit on my prax. It was a really confronting and difficult situation and for me personally and everyone involved and I'm just trying to work out how I feel about it and I've been advised by my clinical facilitators to make a journal entry, lay my thoughts out and analyze it and I started doing that but I decided I would make a video on it so that I can make something at least a bit more positive out of an unpleasant situation I experienced, kind of like an online debrief. In the field of nursing and perhaps health in general, we like to do these things called debriefing. This is a time when we get together and talk about things that bothered us in our shift get feedback on what happened and just to make sure we don't continue carrying those negative thoughts and feelings with us when we go home. As I might have mentioned before, I'm a nursing student. I'm in my last year now and that means we go on longer placements, taking care of increasingly more complex patients and treatments. We're basically as close to being a nurse as someone possibly can be without really being a nurse. And that means we see and experience things that can be pretty harrowing. But you have no choice but to buckle down and deal with it because someone's life is at stake. So I would like to put a trigger warning here for eating disorders. If you are currently experiencing an ED or are just recovering from one, and if you don't feel safe, please click off this video because I don't want to cause you to relapse. Also, please note that this isn't an indicator or a benchmark of all ED or borderline personality disorder cases. This is just my personal experience with a patient that happened to have those backgrounds. So... For context, I was doing my prac on a medical assessment unit. This is the ward that people who arrive via ambulance or emergency department go to for doctors to review them and decide the best course of action. Sometimes they'll be sent up to a ward for further monitoring and treatment and sometimes they'll be allowed to go home straight away. The point is, patients in this ward don't tend to stay for very long. One thing that surprised me most about this ward was the amount of eating disorder patients we receive, often with extensive mental health histories and most if not all cases I've seen so far are very young women. Most of them were admitted in critical condition, often having starved themselves for days or weeks on end and are now facing life-threatening conditions. ED has one of the highest death rates of all mental health conditions and the reason for that isn't just starvation. Most people with ED often die of heart attacks and that's because of a condition known as hypokalemia. This is a state where the level of potassium in your blood is way too low, which affects your heart's ability to maintain a normal rhythm and thus induces a heart attack. Other very common conditions experienced by people with ED are low blood sugar, also called hypoglycemia, which can send you into a coma because glucose is essentially the main energy supply for our brain. Or elevated levels of ketones, also called ketosis. You might recognize the term from keto diets, which is essentially when you try to burn fat for energy. It's beneficial, but an excess actually causes a buildup of these molecules called ketones, which is very acidic in nature and it will therefore cause your body to become too acidic and denature your proteins. 
for a visual representation of what I mean, this is like when you cook an egg and the egg whites start to go from clear to white, basically cooking you from the inside. In short, if these women don't receive any nutritional or electrolyte supplements, they will die. But unfortunately, most of the cases I've seen have been admitted through a treating authority under the Guardianship Act. The Guardianship Act is a legislation here in Australia that dictates patients must have capacity to provide valid consent. This can include refusing a medical treatment. However, they must fulfill three requirements to do that. That they understand the nature and effect of decisions about the matter, that they are freely and voluntarily making their decisions, and that they are able to communicate their decisions in some way. All the patients I've seen so far have been seen by psychiatrists and have been in and out of the mental health unit countless times, so their mental health state has been thoroughly observed and assessed, and they were deemed to lack capacity. They don't realize what their ED is doing to their bodies, how severe their physical state is, so they'll try to refuse anything that would have calories in it, be it food or glucose infusions. Therefore, the doctors are allowed to provide treatment for them even if they decline. I won't speak too much on the experience of adult eating disorders, but Jaden Animations did an amazing video about her first-hand experience with it, so I highly recommend you guys check that out for more context. But this particular patient I had was different from the other cases I'd seen so far, because she was actually there voluntarily. She'd presented several times before, and she'd been stable for a little while, but began to relapse. She recognized her own deterioration and voluntarily sought treatment. And in this situation, I let my personal biases affect my thought process. For the sake of protecting this patient's identity, I'm going to call her Rose. Rose was very anorexic and weak when I first saw her. On top of her ED, she also had borderline personality disorder and a history of self-harm and suicidal ideation and intent. We were about the same age and we had a lot in common. We liked the same kinds of TikToks and we both hated e-boy thirst traps. She was studying in university as well, and I even recommended her some YouTubers I like to watch that she could watch too if she was feeling bored. I felt that we got along really well, and we had a pretty good rapport. In my head, I wanted to make her experience be as positive as possible. I wanted to be a good nurse to her. I've seen other ED patients before, not necessarily my patients, just in passing, and a lot of them often have borderline personality disorder too. Whenever I saw them, they were always very upset and in tears, but the nurses seemed to keep an emotional distance from them. I later found out why. Rose knew I was a student, and she knew that I was looking after her that day. I told her that myself. At the same time, she had an IV infusion running. She had blood tests done and we found out her potassium was really low, as was her blood pressure and her sugar levels and her ketones were through the roof and only getting higher. During her overnight stay, she had an infusion running to try and remedy the hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, and ketosis, and when my shift began, she had already finished the bag. She was charted a new IV bag that was basically more of the same thing, and that's when the trouble started. As soon as my nurse started the infusion, she started screaming and crying, saying that the infusion was hurting. So we slowed the rate down as slow as we possibly could. It was running at about 30 mils 
30 milliliters guys per hour because it's possible sometimes if you infuse IV fluids too quickly it can be a bit sore didn't work she kept crying and screaming so a different nurse came in and paused the infusion give her time to let the pain subside see it's pretty common for potassium infusions to sting a little as it goes in your vein but she desperately needed the infusion and as soon as it was paused her blood sugar began to drop under the normal limits so we had to keep the infusion running my nurse had given her an ice pack but the only time her pain would stop was if we stopped the pump but being a new naive nurse it was hard listening to a patient screaming and crying and just not doing anything. It was scary seeing someone in so much distress and writhing in bed, rubbing her arm. And despite all the knowledge and skills you had, you couldn't do anything. And all my attempts to help and console her just made things worse. I tried asking her if she needed pain relief, and that escalated her hysteria. She started saying she wanted the cannula out and that she didn't want it put back in at all. And I made the mistake of saying that I did see some redness on her arm near the cannula site. And in my head, I was immediately thinking, maybe it's phlebitis, or maybe... The vein had failed. Maybe there's an obstruction happening. Should we stop the infusion and flush the cannula? Should we recite it? I was genuinely trying to find all these solutions and explanations and she latched on to that. She latched on to my hesitation and uncertainty. And I was later told that that redness was simply because she'd been rubbing her arm so much. I been influenced by my own bias and rapport with her that I didn't even think to question why she was doing this other than she must genuinely be in pain and I didn't want to give her this treatment if it caused her pain but she knew I was new and naive and she'd used it against me to try and cease this life-saving treatment because that's what we're taught as nurses. We're taught to believe every patient when they say they have pain because only they can know whether or not they don't. Pain is such a subjective thing. Everyone experiences it differently and we don't have any objective way of measuring it other than the person's reporting of it. But there have been so many studies out there that have found evidence that it can significantly affect a person's recovery. And I just never expected that I wouldn't be able to trust my own patients about their pain. See, I spoke to my clinical facilitator about what happened and she told me that ED patients can be very divisive. It depends on their full mental health history, but they tend to be manipulative and they will do everything in their power to stop themselves from receiving any calories because it's all about that control. Stopping themselves from having any calories is the only thing they feel they can control in their life, even if it means ripping out their nasogastric tubes, no matter how many times it's reinserted. And the thing that was distressing Rose the most, the thing that had gotten her screaming and bawling her eyes out, it wasn't the potassium or pain, it was the glucose. That was when it all made sense. My facilitator knew Rose and her history. She's been in and out of hospital for her ED many times and she's very familiar with all the different fluids she's received. She has had those fluid infusions before. Heck, she had a bag of it running just before my shift started and there were no issues. But then she had me, a gullible nursing student, and decided to take her chance to get me to stop that infusion to fuel her ED. 
I think the most harrowing part of the situation is that she wasn't being manipulative to harm me. She was being manipulative to harm herself. Although she was a voluntary patient, although she presented saying that she wanted to get better, relinquishing control over the one thing she felt she had control over is scary. So she falls back to that ED and I understand that. It completely consumes you. And the rose I was talking to about TikTok was a completely different rose than the one that was screaming for me to take out her cannula. I know it wasn't really her. It was her ED. My supervising nurse knew right away what she was doing. All the experienced nurses did, but I'd played right into her theatrics and I didn't even think that the glucose in the IV fluids we were running would distress her that much or that she would even think to count it as caloric intake. And I know it sounds stupid, I, it sounds stupid now hearing myself say it, but I let my rapport with her get in the way of my critical thinking. I gave her excuses accidentally to escalate her behavior and because of that, the doctors weren't able to review her. Later on, she ended up failing her meal trials as well by the dietitian, and she had to be reviewed by the psychiatrist who decided it would be best to put her on a nasogastric tube, which she's had before. And although I know I couldn't have possibly changed or done anything about that, I can't help but feel like that was my fault. I think the worst part of it was feeling like I'd made my supervising nurse's job so much harder when I wanted to make her day easier by helping her. When she told me off on all the mistakes I'd made, I wanted to shrivel up and disappear because in my head, I felt that she was really, really upset at me and she didn't want me to be there. She told me to step back from taking care of Rose and somehow my mind interpreted that as her saying, you fucked up. You fucked up your chance to look after this patient. And I was really sad for the rest of the day, but I tried not to let it show because I'm a professional. So how am I feeling right now? Uh, I'm asking this more to myself than anyone. I feel scared, mostly. Scared that I'm going to show up to placement next week and they're gonna tell me to go home because I fucked up and they don't want me there. I'm scared that I'm not a safe practitioner and I'm scared that I messed things up for Rose because I didn't do the right thing. I feel guilty for potentially upsetting my nurse and I feel upset that I got told off, but hey. That's just a part of life, isn't it? And I just learned from this experience that in some cases, when you're looking after a patient, you have to put your foot down and not give in, especially in patients with behavioral issues, even if it feels like you're neglecting them. I've learned the hard way that sometimes it's worse to acknowledge those behaviors because you're giving them affirmation to keep doing it. And when, when those actions are harmful to them, it's better to have them hate you for trying to keep them safe for in the long run. At the end of the day, you will always have more knowledge than your patients about health conditions. When they're vulnerable, it's your duty to do what's best to protect them. And when you're refusing them, you're not doing it to be a bad person and make their lives miserable. You're doing it because you care about them and you want them to get better. It's tough love is what it is. And I have to tough up a bit and <laughs> not be such a doormat all the time and tell them, hey, I'm sorry, I know it's uncomfortable, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. Because they will. The treatments will be necessary for them. 
I'm just thankful that I hadn't done anything rash like stopping her infusion because despite everything, I knew very well that she needed those fluids and they had to keep running no matter what so that she can actually get better or at least be at a stage where she can get better. It's tricky to think about because you still have that guilt, you still have that feeling that this is counterintuitive to what you learned, but situations happen in health where it feels like you're doing the wrong thing when really in that specific context, that's the right thing to do, especially in mental health which is always a very tricky subject, I feel like, and I enjoy talking about that a lot. You really do have to get over the mentality that you can and will fix everything, because most of the time, you won't. All you can do is help them get to a point where they feel like they can go on by themselves. Thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. I really, really appreciate you sitting through my personal ramblings and trying to work out my own feelings. I do genuinely hope that Rose gets better and I hope I don't see her again when I come back onto the wards and I hope she gets the help she needs. Anyway, I feel a lot better after making this video. It really helps me process kind of what happened and to improve my own practice moving forward, just learning from this experience. If you guys have any thoughts or, well, any of your own feelings you would like to share, feel free to comment it down below. And yeah, if you guys want to support me, I have a Ko-fi account which will be linked in the description as well as a Discord server where we do a lot of fun art stuff all the time. Um, I was also just made aware that apparently Yandere Simulator is complete now because Yandere Dev is gonna be releasing all 10 rivals. Um, I'm gonna talk about that maybe in another video. But yeah, follow me on all my social media, check out my comic because that will make me really happy, and I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye! Thank you.